Now it's my uh, pleasure to pass the word to our uh, very welcome guest, uh, Olivia Kreft from uh, Promega, uh, Germany. Uh, and she will share some information about uh, Promega company. So uh, Olivia, please take the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. I will quickly turn on the camera to say hi. So hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, first of all, I would like to say that it's really great pleasure to join this webinar today. And um, yeah, so I will share my screen with you. Just give me a quick sign if you can see it. Yeah, OK, perfect. So. Um, yeah, I just very shortly want to use the chance in the beginning to introduce myself and um, to give you some general information about Promega. So as Andre said, my name is Olivia and I'm working for the Promega GmbH. So um, for the branch office in Germany and my main responsibilities are the scientific state support of our partners in Central and Eastern Europe. And yeah, just some general informations um, on the Promega cooperation. Um, Promega was founded in 1978. The headquarter is in the USA, in Madison, Wisconsin. And today we have branch offices in 16 countries worldwide with more than 1 1,600 employees. And yeah, like that, we are able to provide over 4,000 products uh, for life science and applied research in more than 100 countries. And our innovation is driven by our large developmental research and developmental unit. And even though this is written here at last, um, this is really the most important thing for us. And this is to really understand your needs and to guarantee an excellent customer service. And yeah, as I said, I'm working for the Promega GmbH in Germany. This was founded a bit later in 1997. Today we have more than 100 employees. And last year we received this very new building, which also includes the European Logistics Center and um, the Instrument Service Center. And from there we manage service, service and sales in Germany, Austria and Eastern Europe. Here you can see the map just to show you an over, overview. As I said, the headquarter is in Madison. We have manufacturing facilities in the US and in Korea and Shanghai. In purple, these are our branch offices and all the other dots are our partners worldwide. And yeah, eSport is our very close and experienced partner for Czech Republic since many, many years. And we really highly appreciate this cooperation and uh, yeah, we try to support them as good as we can. In addition, I just uh, yeah, I want to point out that Promega develops and produces products in house. Yeah, so we have more than 500 global patents and more than 80% of our products are developed and manufactured in house. And yeah, these products provide solutions for the basic research, for applied research, for drug discovery, forensics, and also for molecular, molecular diagnostics. And we have as one important feature, um, a very flexible manufacturing. So in case you have a specific product or specific needs in terms of volume, concentration or specific kit components, and you can't find this in the product portfolio of Promega, don't hesitate to contact eSport because we support and provide customized solutions. And because of our international quality standards, uh, we guarantee consistency and repro reproductibility. So don't hesitate to contact eSport in case you have a specific request or a specific project. And um, at last, I just quickly want to show you the overview of our product portfolio. Um, of course, today, 
the webinar will be focused on cellular ana analysis. But if you are interested in products in terms of DNA and RNA analysis for genetic identity, we offer, for example, forensic and paternity testing and STR typing. We offer products for the molecular diagnostics, also instruments for um, luminometer and fluorometer, our Glomax system for DNA and RNA extraction, our Maxwell systems, and very recently also our new capillary electrophoresis instrument. And, and um, yeah, we also have solutions for drug development and of course protein analysis. And yeah, today Jaroslav will tell you a lot about our cellular analysis. And with this, I would like to thank eSport for the invitation to this webinar. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to hear Jaroslav. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let's jump right right into it. I'll share my screen. Everything's right. Everything's fine. Yes. I switch on my camera for a better connection. All right. So. I'm going to talk about uh, cell-based assays from Promega, which can be used in various fields of biology. Uh, but today we will focus only on a few areas. We can introduce the other applications to you um, on another occasion. We will later send you the presentation slides from today, so yeah, you don't have to uh, make detailed notes. Uh, in the first part, I'll be talking about assays for measuring uh, cell viability, cytotoxicity, and apoptosis. In the second part, I will focus on assays for measuring uh, cellular metabolism and oxidative stress. The first part will take around 40 minutes, and the second part will be slightly shorter, don't worry, and there will be a quick break in between. Uh, so let's start with cell viability. It uh, can be measured in several different ways using various biomarkers of cellular health. Uh, the first two in the list will be important today. It's the ability of the cellular metabolism to produce reducing equivalents and to reduce various substrates. And secondly, it's the ability of cells to make ATP and maintain its levels in the cell. Traditionally, for decades, uh, cell viability has been measured by color change of uh, resazurin or formazin uh, as they were reduced by cellular metabolism. Uh, the results of such assay can be detected either by measuring absorbance or in case of uh, resorufrin also by measuring the fluorescence. These assays are cheap uh, and not very accurate, but Promega has them on offer as well. Uh, the reason is mainly because some uh, conservative customers are used to them and for some types of experiments, these assays are still okay and sufficient. However, uh, they are not suitable for more sophisticated applications like uh, high throughput screening. You can see that uh, the sensitivity of these assays is not high. They, they have a detection threshold at hundreds or even thousands of cells. Uh, another problem is that uh, the cells have to be cultured with these reagents for several hours, and it is not entirely clear when exactly the assay should be read out. Plus, these compounds are uh, also slightly toxic to the cells. And data from these assays usually have quite large variability, and it is not unusual that scientists measure these assays in four or even five uh, replicates. The gold standard in measuring cell viability is another much more sensitive assay. It's a luminescence-based assay called Cellizer Glow, and it measures cellular ATP content and thus uh, serves to quantify uh, only the metabolically active cells. So this essay takes advantage of the fact that uh, ATP serves as a cofactor in the fi firefly luciferase uh, light generating reaction. 
the assay is uh, designed so that ATP released from lysed cells is a limiting factor in this reaction. And Promega uses an improved uh, recombinant firefly luciferase called UltraGlow, just so that you understand uh, the graphics. Uh, this assay is a type of assay which we call an endpoint assay because uh, the protocol begins with cell lysis. But Promega also offers kinetic assays that measure the viability of living cells continuously. These uh, live cell assays are suitable for situations in which you're not sure when exactly the toxicity of your tested substances will uh, manifest on, on the cells. And in some cases, people use the kinetic assays because they are actually interested in the kinetics of the toxicity. Uh, different drugs can wildly differ in, in this parameter, and it could be an uh, important piece of information. And I, I'll show a few kinetic assays later in the talk. But let's uh, focus on uh, cell, titer, cell titer glow for now. Um, so what does a typical protocol for cell titer glow uh, look like. The assay consists of only one reagent, which either needs to be reconstituted when you start using the assay, or the reagent arrives already mixed and frozen. This applies to the assay version 2.0. Uh, the cell titer glow reagent uh, contains everything that it's needed, except for ATP. After addition to the plate, uh, the reagent uh, first lyses the cells, and it is important to mix the plate with the assay very well to facilitate the lysis. Then you just wait 10 minutes for the signal to stabilize, and you can measure the luminescence on any conventional luminometer. Uh, the design of uh, the assay reduces pipetting to a minimum. There is only one pipetting step, uh, and this uh, saves obviously laboratory consumables, which is relevant for high throughput screening applications, but more importantly, uh, minimized pipetting eliminates a potential source of variability coming from imprecise pipetting. The detection limit of this assay is about 10 cells per well, which becomes important if you if you work with uh, very precious uh, material or you want to uh, miniaturize the assay, for example, to 384 or uh, 384 or 1536 well plates. Such uh, high throughput screening uh, scenarios show the power of this assay best. The, the white dynamic range is also important. It allows you to measure everything on one plate the weak samples together with the strong samples and the positive control without uh, the need for diluting the samples. And if you are not, not only interested in, in the relative comparisons between uh, treated versus control samples, you can also use uh, an ATP calibration curve to directly quantify the concentration of ATP in your cells. And you may be thinking that ATP is a rather unstable molecule, so how come it doesn't decompose immediately when you lyse the cells? Uh, this is because uh, cell titer glow reagent contains uh, ATPase inhibitors. Uh, as you can see from the graph, when you compare pure HEPIS buffer and uh, cell titer glow assay just without the luciferase enzyme, uh, less than half of ATP would be left without inhibitors after one hour incubation. Inhibitors are uh, inhibitors of the ATPases are one of the two reasons why it is necessary to follow the assay protocol carefully and always add the assay reagent in one to one ratio to the cell culture medium. Uh, the second reason to use uh, cell titer glow at the right concentration is uh, cell lysis, which may not happen completely at lower concentrations of the reagent. So I mentioned also the 2.0 version of the cell titer glow before. Uh, let's uh, take a look at that. 
Newer version, this 2.0, has uh, increased stability and therefore it can be delivered already dissolved as the final assay reagent. It can be stored uh, taut in the fridge for a long time. For example, when you perform a series of experiments over several weeks, you can keep it uh, melted in the fridge. Otherwise, it is um, still recommended to keep it in minus 80 for long term storage. Uh, it can last years in the minus 80. Uh, the biggest risk uh, when handling this assay is that you yourself contaminate it with ATP, uh, which can come, for example, from your hands. Uh, therefore, it's, it's better not to handle it unnecessarily. Don't aliquot it uh, because the assay will survive several cycles of freeze and thaw with uh, unchanged uh, signal strength. Other version is the 3D, 3D version. So uh, cell hydroglow also exists in a validated uh, version for 3D cell cultures. This version has uh, enhanced lytic capacity and modified protocol with more intense uh, shaking and longer incubation to support the cell lysis. This assay is uh, relatively difficult to adapt to a free ATVOR 384 well format because uh, properly mixing uh, this 384 well plate is not trivial. It requires a special shaker with radius that is smaller than the diameter of, of the wells. Um, even after complete lysis, uh, sometimes the skeleton of the extracellular matrix of the spheroid that you are lysing might remain visible in the well but this should not confuse you. The lysis of the cells was likely successful. It's just there is this ghost of the of the micro tissue left uh, in the well. Compared to uh, competitor assays, uh, this assay can extract a higher percentage of ATP from the spheroids, which can be seen in the graph in the right corner. The explanation for this difference is clear uh, from the pictures on the left. Uh, competitor assays are not able to lyse the interior of the spheroids, here visualized by a dye that only stains the DNA of cells with uh, impaired uh, membrane integrity. It's actually a cell dog screen assay from Formega, and I will talk about uh, this uh, dye later in the cytotoxicity part of the talk. Finally, one last slide about uh, cell dietary glow. Um, I would like to summarize some practical advice, and most of these points will also apply to other luminescent assays, which I will discuss later. Uh, I would like to uh, point out that ultra glow luciferase is a really good enzyme. It's uh, resistant to inhibitors, uh, uh, various small molecules uh, can inhibit other luciferases. It's a known problem in high throughput screening. Uh, so ultra glow is much more resistant to that. Another great feature of ultra glow is that it, it's very resilient towards uh, temperature changes. And the, the sequence of ultra glow is secret, it's proprietary, and it is an advantage of Promega over, over the competition which does not have such a such a good Farfly enzyme. So when it comes to handling this assay, it's a good idea to keep um, it always in the dark and never heat it up uh, above 37 uh, degree, uh, sorry, above uh, room, temp room temperature. So don't melt it uh, in a water bath set uh, at 37. It's quite temperature uh, sensitive for these higher uh, temperatures. Um, serum and phenyl red have no effect on cell titer glow. Uh, so this is really the easiest uh, assay you can uh, think of. But uh, this cannot be said in general about other Promega assays. Some of them are better uh, done in serum free conditions and without phenyl red. 
So yeah, for the other for the other essays, always read the technical manuals uh, carefully, uh, whether serum can be a problem or not. And when you are preparing the ATP calibration curve for cell light or glow, uh, it's best done in serum-free medium actually, because uh, serum can have some residual ATPase activity. And before you add uh, the assay reagent, uh, you are supposed to take the cells out of the incubator and let the plate equilibrate to room temp temperature. Uh, the cell cooling has a negligible effect on the ATP content and Promega has data on it. So always do, do this uh, cooling uh, properly. You will avoid a temperature gradient across the plate, which would lead to an uh, uneven rate of luciferase reaction. And then you would see edge effects in your data. And also never use uh, overgrown cells uh, or too many cells per well in the assay. Uh, the ATP concentration in overgrown cells decreases, and if you have too many cells per well, the signal half-life will be very short because the assay components will be uh, consumed really fast. Different uh, cell types naturally differ in um, ATP content, and this should be taken into account and tested. When you run uh, the assay for the first time with new cells, uh, you have to determine this experimentally. And uh, in general, uh, Cell Data Glow is really popular assay worldwide. Customers in the Czech Republic buy liters of it every year from us. Uh, and you might think it is expensive, but actually it's not. Just check the price on our website or ask us uh, for a quote. So, viability uh, can also be monitored in, in real time with uh, real time glow assay. It is based on a principle that is already familiar to us. A cross substrate is added to the cell media and then it is reduced by cellular metabolism, which uh, transforms it into a functional luminescent substrate that we can detect. Uh, in this case, uh, the substrate is furimazin a luminescent substrate for nanoluciferase, another important enzyme from Promega. Uh, it produces 10 or 100 times higher luminescent signal than firefly luciferase and is uh, mainly used in a lot of the new assays from Promega. In this way, uh, cell viability can be measured for up to 70 hours. So what does the workflow and data look like in this assay? The assay can be added to the cells uh, when they are seeded or later at the same time when the test substances are added or even at the end of your experiment. The luminescence is then read at uh, specified time intervals. Uh, at the bottom left, you see typical data from the assay. Uh, so you may wonder how I would um, convert them to something I'm familiar with, like curves from which I can calculate the inhibitory concentration, EC50, etc. One, one easy method uh, is shown in the graph on the right. We can relate the viability of cells with uh, a drug, in this case a bortezomib, which is a protezomal inhibitor. Uh, so we can relate uh, these values to the viability of cells in the control and now you start seeing these familiar curves. On this slide I would like to explain uh, another advantage of this essay. Uh, Profurimazin does not pass uh, so easily through the membrane in and out of the cells. So the reduced furimazine does not accumulate much in the assay. That means uh, the luminescent signal that we see at any moment uh, corresponds to the current situation of cell viability as shown by the green bars in the graph. As soon as we uh, kill the cells or perturb the membrane integrity here with uh, Triton X100, uh, we see a decrease in the luminescent signal within two minutes. 
In contrast, uh, in the classical Alamar blue assay, the fluorescent product resorufrin is accumulating over time. Uh, this means that its amount does not necessarily reflect the current state of the cells. So I would like to summarize a few practical tips for this assay. After you perform the assay, the cells can be used for any other experiment. For example, the study of gene expression by RT-QPCR. Uh, Real-time glow can also um, be used um, as an endpoint assay because you get to the results very quickly. And when you are uh, performing this assay, you should always prepare the assay reagent fresh uh, for just this particular experiment. It basically means diluting it 1000 times. Of course, uh, this is measured at 37 degrees. And it's good to be quick when you are transferring the cells between the incubator and the reader. Um, usually the luminal matter has uh, good temperature control. It is important because if the temperature of the plate is uneven, uh, the edge effects would appear, as I, as I already mentioned. Uh, so because the direction, uh, the luciferase reaction would run faster in the center of the plate compared to the edges. Uh, alternatively, if you have a reader with atmosphere and temperature control, you can perform the entire experiment with cultivation in, in the reader. Also, um, be careful about reducing agents that may be present in some uh, media formulations and could influence the, the results. Uh, this essay is uh, well suited for multiplexing uh, with uh, the Celtics green cytotoxicity reagent I will talk about right now. So, quantification of cytotoxicity. Uh, how is actually uh, cytotoxicity commonly defined? Uh, mainly as a loss of cytoplasmic membrane integrity. I will present uh, only two of a relatively broad range of uh, cytotoxicity assays from Formiga. The first one is uh, Celtox Green, which has already been mentioned. Uh, it is a dye that binds to DNA but is uh, unable to penetrate the cytoplasmic membrane of healthy cells and therefore binds only to DNA in necrotic cells. We are then able to detect this binding event as increasing uh, green fluorescence because the dye fluoresces only when it is bound to DNA. This uh, assay has uh, several advantages. It can be used for kinetic measurements for up to three days, can be multiplexed with uh, luminescent, assay, luminescent assays. Uh, this assay is non-toxic and the cells can then be used for any downstream experiment. It is also compatible with 3D cell cultures as we have seen before. Uh, it can be detected not only in a plate reader, but also by microscopy or flow cytometry using standard green fluorescence filters for GFP or FITS. And it's an assay that's really cheap. So it's, it's worth it adding, adding routinely to your luminescent assays to get more information and maybe troubleshoot your uh, assay. Celtox Green has a flexible protocol. Uh, as I said, it can be added uh, at any time when you are anyway manipulating with your cells, when you seed them, when you are adding uh, some treatment to them or at the end of the experiment. This uh, essay was uh, directly developed for multiplexing. It goes well with kinetic luminescent assays or other luminescent assays. You can see the combination with the kinetic assay in the lower right corner with real-time glow. Celtox green multiplexing also helps to distinguish between cytotoxic and cytostatic effects, as you can see in the graph in the lower left corner. The fact uh, that the signal from cell dye to glow drops does not necessarily mean that uh, your cells on the plate are dying. In some cases, only their metabolism and growth is stopped if the drug has cytostatic effect. 
Uh, Celtic screen can also be used in uh, trial experiments to determine when to measure apoptosis, as seen in the graph in the upper right corner, where the apoptotic signal briefly precedes the cytotoxic signal. So when you see the first sign of cytotoxicity, uh, your apoptosis, apoptosis signaling is probably at its peak and it's a good, good moment to, to measure it. So the second essay for measuring cytotoxicity uses um, the same general principle that it is disruption of the membrane integrity and it quantifies the activity of lactide dehydrogenase enzyme that leaked from necrotic cells. There are many assays to measure LDH on the market, but none reaches the sensitivity of the luminescent assay from Formega. The assay is based on the detection of NADH, which uh, LDH produces by oxidation of lactate to pyruvate. Um, and this NADH is used in a coupled enzymatic reaction to reduce uh, pro-luciferin to luciferin. Here, the pro-luciferin is called uh, reductase substrate. In this type of assay, pro-luciferin um, is, uh, it's, sorry, um, yeah, I want to say um, something else. So that this assay also works for 3D cell cultures and uh, can be used to measure uh, cytotoxicity typically of cancer cells on which uh, various new methods of biologics treatment are being tested, such as uh, monoclonal antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, uh, CAR T cells and, and similar approaches. <clears throat> the real uh, power of this essay lies uh, in the fact that it can be used in a pseudo kinetic format because it is very sensitive. It is enough to take only a few microliters of cell culture medium at each time point. Then you dilute it and freeze it. And you can measure all these uh, samples at once at the end of the experiment. And what you get back is kinetic data. Uh, an example of such data is shown in the graph uh, to the right where breast cancer cells have been exposed to the antibody drug conjugate called Catsilla, which is an anti-HER2 antibody conjugated to microtubule inhibitor. And you can see how <clears throat> uh, the toxicity of this antibody drug conjugate kicks in uh, slowly. So I will now um, turn to the third important process we can follow, namely the apoptosis. Promega assays measure apoptosis by quantifying the activity of caspases, and caspases are the enzymes specifically activated during apoptosis, and they orchestrate the whole process of uh, programmed cell death. Um, apoptotic uh, assays use a modified luciferin uh, a substrate for ultraglow luciferase again. Uh, this uh, substrate is modified with a peptide. You see that uh, in the picture as DEVD. And uh, this DEVD peptide is a substrate for a particular caspase, uh, in this case, uh, caspase 3 and 7. Uh, the workflow of the assay is similar to cell titer glow. Initially, you reconstitute the assay reagent. Uh, it is added one to one to the cells in the cultured medium. Uh, the reagent uh, first lyses the cells. Good mixing is again essential for the success of this assay. And then uh, luminescent signal starts to develop. And uh, after a while, the activity of the caspase and luciferase uh, finds a, a stable point and so that's after about 30 minutes and you can measure the luminescence. 
Here in, in this table, you can see uh, the spectrum of other modified substrates for other case spaces, uh, both the initiator and effector case spaces. And a special case is case space one. This is an enzyme important for pyroptosis, uh, an immunogenic type of cell death, typical for cells of uh, non-specific immunity. During uh, pyroptosis, cells first release uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and then they die and trigger local inflammation. Now, on this slide, I would like to take a short break from uh, the specific assays and explain uh, why luminescence uh, as a detection modality is such a, a good approach for cell-based assays and why I have talked almost exclusively about luminescence-based uh, assays so far. So uh, this graph uh, or this experiment compares uh, the sensitivity of uh, three similar uh, caspase assays based on molecules modified by the DEVD peptide. It's luciferin, rhodamine, and uh, aminofluorocumarin. Uh, so luminescence is one or two orders of magnitude more, more sensitive in these data. And this is not because uh, the luminescence signal is stronger than fluorescence, but the main reason is because unlike fluorescence, uh, luminescence has a negligible background. Uh, unlike measuring fluorescence, we do not need any excitation light to measure luminescence. It's just generated by the chemical reaction. There is also no uh, compound in the cell that would spontaneously produce light in contrast to a whole range of molecules uh, that show autofluorescence. For those who are uh, not proficient in measuring luminescence, I should add that uh, luminescence assays need to be measured in white opaque plates uh, in which we can obtain the high signal. You should uh, never use the transparent plates. They are completely unsuitable because the light signal overflows into the surrounding wells and you have a huge crosstalk in your measurement. If you are measuring a multiplexed luminescent and fluorescent assay, you can measure it either in white or black plates, uh, depending on the relative strength of, uh, of the two signals. Black plates decrease the signal quite a lot, but it can happen that the fluorescent signal in white plates is too high and then you switch to the black plates. So in, in general, why does it matter? Why is, why is high sensitivity so important? Uh, in this case of caspase assays, uh, we could detect apoptosis earlier, meaning uh, at an earlier stage of the process. And also uh, we can use a smaller reaction volume and save both the assay reagent as well as the cells and tested molecules. So here again, I have uh, summarized some practical advice. The First is related to the mentioned uh, sensitivity. Since uh, the assay is so sensitive, we will detect uh, low caspase activity also in control cells, cells or just, just in serum. It is uh, therefore necessary to use uh, two different controls in this assays, both untreated cells as well as uh, just plain medium only. Uh, the value of uh, luminescence from the wells with medium, that is the real background of your assay, and then uh, you should subtract it from all the measured values. And that's not a specialty of this assay, but something common for all, uh, all luminescence assays. Um, for the success of Caspase Glow, as well as other solvist assays, it is essential that the cells used for the assay are in good condition. Uh, by that I mean that they are regularly passaged always to the same density and similar numbers of cell passages are used in these experiments. Like don't use cells ones that were just freshly taught and the next time some cells that you were been uh, culturing for months. 
because if 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 uh, the cells that you use um, in these essays are every time slightly different, you are bringing a source of variability into your data that you cannot control. It's unnecessary. Also, another issue would be that uh, if you use overgrown cells uh, in the essay, uh, they the overgrown cells temporarily uh, change their metabolism and also their uh, proliferative signaling is completely changed. So that will be a confounding factor in your essay. And importantly, caspase activity is present only transiently in dying cells. So it is um, first necessary to determine when is the best moment to measure it. It should uh, be before the cells actually start to, to die. A suitable um, measurement interval is this uh, 30 minutes uh, to one hour after adding uh, caspase glow. Uh, this is the interval with uh, very stable signal, uh, but it is good to measure the plate also later again, just so you get an idea how, how the signal develops and fades slowly. Uh, equilibration of this assay reagent um, and the cell plate to room temperature, that's something I've already said, and it's uh, important in all the assays. And, uh, for the special caspase glow assays for uh, caspases 8 and 9, uh, these may partially uh, pick up also uh, activity of the proteasome, and, and therefore uh, you have the MG132 proteasome inhibitor included uh, in the kit as well. So the caspase glow 3.7 also exists um, in a version optimized for 3D cell cultures with rougher lysis conditions and modified experimental protocol similar to the cell title glow 3D. Uh, it was validated uh, for spheroids grown in both liquid medium or matter gel. There is also a, a special protocol for the cells grown in matter gel, which uh, significantly increases the signal, which you can see in the graph in the lower right corner. It's this so-called alternative protocol. It requires requires one um, additional reagent uh, from Corning. It's all described in the technical manual. And here I want to add uh, a few words about data normalization. Uh, because uh, when we test uh, toxic substances on cells, uh, it can bring uh, with it the error that some of the cells die before the assay measurement. So even though we see the same number of cells uh, into each well, the signal might hugely differ. So what can we do with this? Ideally, you would measure the assay before the cell necrosis occurs. We should also measure before the uh, negative effect of the tested substances could manifest in a slower proliferation rate of the cells. But no matter what we do, we will have some uh, toxicity in these assays. So there are two good ways to normalize. First is using a multiplex assay in the same well, or alternatively, uh, you can measure the viability of the cells uh, with the test substances in parallel in a second plate next to your primary assay. An example of such uh, multiplex assay is Apolive Glow, which combines caspase glow 3.7 and a fluorogenic uh, substrate that is uh, cleaved by the protease activity, which is uh, specific for living cells. So you, you can use the fluorescent signal to normalize your luminescent signal. Because um, we can easily filter red and green fluorescence, we can actually use uh, three assays at once to measure apoptosis, viability, and cytotoxicity at the same time, uh, and to distinguish substances that uh, primarily trigger necrosis, apoptosis, 
uh, and or cytostasis. Uh, apoptosis uh, can actually also be measured in the kinetic format, which I will talk about now. So it's the real-time glow annexin 5 assay. Promega has uh, developed an assay based on the well-known apoptosis marker annexin 5. It's a protein that binds to phosphatidylserine. Here, uh, annexin is fused to two subunits of the split nanoluciferase, large bit and small bit. Large bit and small bit do not have very high affinity for each other. They need some other uh, protein to bring them into proximity, uh, which is exactly what happens easily on the outer surface of the apoptotic cells uh, that uh, display phosphatidylserine uh, on the outer surface. Uh, so these uh, annexin fusions bind to phosphatidylserine, uh, luciferase is complemented and we can detect uh, the luminescence. Uh, this assay is uh, very useful either in cases where we do not know exactly when apoptosis occurs and when it would be uh, good to measure the endpoint assay, or also mm, in situations where we are interested in the kinetics of, apopto of apoptosis itself, because uh, different substances can cause apoptosis with very different kinetics, and this is a uh, potentially valuable information by measuring each well repeatedly many times, we uh, save uh, huge amounts of reagents, cells, assays, uh, and so on, uh, compared to a situation when we would uh, like to obtain the same data uh, with an endpoint assay. And that's all about apoptotic assays that I wanted uh, to say today. At the end, I want to remind you that eSport does not only uh, distribute from MEGA. Another important company in the field of cell biology is Lonza. Uh, its portfolio includes mainly classic cell culture media, primary cells, and uh, special culture media for these primary cells. Also the nucleofactor technology, which is an uh, electroporation for transfection of cells that cannot be transfected by the standard liquefaction. Typically, it's neurons, lymphocytes, NK cells, all sorts of uh, difficult primary cells. And also in Czech Republic, quite widely used uh, uh, eukaryotic parasites such as trypanosoma. These are also transfectable with uh, Lonza nucleofactor. Uh, Lonza is also a leader in testing for the presence of mycoplasmas and endotoxins. Another uh, one of our suppliers that is uh, relevant uh, to today's lecture uh, on cell-based assays is uh, Cytosmart. It's uh, a Dutch uh, startup uh, that offers microscopes of different sizes and complexity and price for live cell imaging uh, directly in the cell culture incubator. For example, you can use these micro microscopes um, to observe how cell confluence changes over several days, which is yet another way how to test for uh, cell viability or cytotoxicity. Or you can also measure cell migration and wound healing assays or quantify colony formation, for example. Uh, we can easily arrange a demo of these instruments for you or connect you with the customers here in Czech Republic who already use Cytosmart microscopes. And finally, I would like to draw your attention to a very good source of information. It's the Promega webinar library. Uh, Promega has an extensive collection of past webinars on its website, many of which touch on the topics I was talking about today. I would especially uh, recommend uh, this one particular webinar because it also deals with the steps that are preceding uh, your cell-based assays. It uh, 
uh, it's focused on the proper cultivation of cells and standardization of these processes. Uh, so to sum it up, we have learned in the first part of today's webinar about assays for measuring cell viability, cytotoxicity and topoptosis. I talked about different formats for 2D and 3D cell cultures. Uh, I talked about endpoint assays and also kinetic assays. Uh, these assays were based on various principles. It was measurement of the concentration of ATP. Uh, we saw modified luminescent substrates that require reduction or protease cleavage. Uh, one exception was the Annexin 5 assay, which was based on the split luciferase technology. Uh, I want to highlight that Promega assays are usually designed as a complete experiment. You will also find uh, some negative and positive uh, control in these assays. And um, the production processes of these assays are really subject to uh, strict quality control. And on the Promega website, you can click through the QC reports down to information about each particular lot of your essay. If you are uh, interested in uh, testing an essay, uh, contact us uh, for a test sample. It will either be uh, free or with a 50% discount, depending on the specific essay. In exchange, we then ask uh, for feedback on how the essay worked for you. Uh, we also offer demos of our devices during which you can try the device for free for a week in your laboratory on your particular application. Uh, this applies uh, not only to microscopes, but also to luminometers, which I will briefly mention in the second part of the webinar and Olivia already mentioned. Um, Promega has uh, a lot of useful information on the website. It's not just the webinars, it's also a lot of application notes. So have a look, uh, have a look there. And if you don't find what you would like to find, uh, write us and uh, we will provide information if it exists. And uh, there is a huge collection of these application notes. So mostly somebody has already done your experiment. So that's it from me. Let's, let's take uh, five minutes now and uh, meet here again two minutes past three and we will continue with the second part and we can also um, still answer your questions about the, the first part so see you in five so it's two minutes past three and maybe we can slowly move into the second part and dive uh, into the essays for measuring metabolism and uh, oxidative stress. So I don't um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So yeah, you can still you can still think think about that. Uh, during the second presentation and if anything's unclear, anything comes up, don't hesitate to ask. Also, you can always write, write us uh, an email later. So, I will now share my screen again.
So if there are no further questions, we will conclude the, the webinar. And yeah, if something comes up later, just uh, send us an email. We will be happy to, to interact and to answer. So thanks everyone for your participation today and goodbye.